Ryan's of the last American vagabond and has been covering a fascinating topic, uh, smart dust, which I just did a quick search and I found in Berkeley news, sprinkling of neural dust opens door to electrocuticles or pseudicles, I guess is probably how they're saying it. This isn't necessarily a new thing. So before we even get to why now you're talking about this, since it's been around for, I don't know, a decade or more, maybe even two decades, what is smart dust for people who have never heard of it before? Well, it's nanotechnology and that this is... It, it's it's an important conversation that's obviously got a lot more attention post the COVID-19 injection lipid nanoparticle. People became very aware of, you know, just the, the concept. But realizing, first of all, that nano uh, particles are anything of a certain size. I, and I don't I forget the exact cutoff, but it's something that is, you know, below the level that would be considered a nanoparticle. And that can be anything. That can be dust. That can be any 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 particle that size. So nanotechnology there is an overlap in regard to utilization of things that are in the nanosphere, but what I, we're talking about specifically is are, are things that are manipulated even into the sense of like technology. Now, I think the word robots in this concept is is kind of archaic, and there's not it doesn't I don't apply, but that's the best kind of word to get people to understand what we're talking about when it comes to things like smart dust. Because this is, these are, you know, and I mean, I even had the video I could pull up if you'd like to play it, which I included on that that post we did. But it's it is something that goes back much longer than than 2016. Uh, you know, early days, I think 2005, and I would argue before that, when you understand how the military often works, DARPA was working on something that is in that clip we played that is so small, and it goes all the way back to 2005. This has been a, when when it was publicly discussed that it is the size of dust. Like literally the size of, and I think what the, he uses in that discussion, which is held, I believe, in 2013, and he's discussing it as a 10-year-old concept or, or 2015, and saying that this is, the, you know, the tenth the size of a piece of paper. And these are things that literally, if you just think of dust, it's stuff that can be spread into the air, and then what they are are actual little pieces of computing power. And so the and these things going back to the DARPA's original vision are they don't need outside power sources and these are things that are running on your own. Okay, that's perfect. So what you're looking at right there is later from the DARPA vision that's called the Hitachi Mu chip. These are all publicly discussed conversations. So it's so interesting how much people push back on this and how the current conversation of today is about these larger clunky things which also exist, but the 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 chip you were showing there was next to a salt crystal. Right. And so and so the point is, yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, not that Snopes should be a, a good gauge. Yeah, on what's but real Ryan, or not, can but you, can you believe ahead. Snopes actually says this is true? It's like the, it's, I don't think I've ever seen Snopes fact check anything that they finally came to say was true. But this they actually say is true. It's because it's so egregiously obvious. It's public. Right. It's it's just it's out there. The public conversation is real. The Hitachi is a large company. Right. These are public de deployments. Now, the point is what you're seeing there on that person's fingertip and next to the human hair, which is the comparison. It's monumentally smaller than that today. That's where we get into the things of Charles Lieber's work. Even going back to 2011, Charles Lieber is a Harvard at the time, still arguably the leading nanotechnology expert in the world, who was the guy who was arrested in the beginning of COVID-19 for working with China research and making money from China, also arrested alongside foreign nationals that were shuttling biological material on their sock from Beth Israel Hospital to China. The point is, he was accused of tre treason. It's a different story, but nothing ever happened in regard to him. It was very confusing and weird, and I think there was more collaboration there. The point is, he, in 2011, worked on what he called the virus-sized transistor. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is a transistor, which again is the better word than robot, but it's nanotechnology that is the size of a virus. And this is not hype. This is, I mean, at the very least, you have to acknowledge they're claiming that's what they did. Of course, they could be making this up for any number of reasons, but there's lots of other work around the world that that proves this. And he are and he what he did in this case was used a fatty lipid layer, which is where this technology comes from in COVID-19. And I'll give you more connections there to bring this into a cell. And so, and he argues that when you get down to this level technological things act like biology. And so it's almost impossible to tell the difference. And my point's always been, how do we not, how do we know that that in and of itself did not become something that we're dealing with today? Right. But that's an abstract theory. The point is these things are very real. And my concern about this, well, and then to describe it a little bit further, these little things you're looking at, each one of these individual things are like a, think of it like a computer chip, right? It runs on your body's own power. It's heat, it's motion, it's energy. And then using things, which we can get into if you'd like, it gets abstract, but things like magnetogenetics, optogenetics, radiogenetics, they, they're able to influence and manipulate these things 
two-way communication, relaying of internal biosurveillance. This is the kind of stuff that really does give me nightmares, and it's very real, and it's very actual, like it's in real time being used in some cases. My question is, how do we, how do we, we should be asking whether this is something that has already been deployed in the, in the, the, the world or in a nation, but it's kind of the same difference when it's a smart dust deploying concept. I went back in my recent show all the way back to the early 2000s with a group called Dust Networks, where they were literally talking about the future. And it's a government overlap connected kind of group that's changed ownership multiple times and saying in, two, in the early 2000s that this was the future of smart cities, of smart grids, exactly where they tell you they're pushing us into now. And the argument was using this smart dust all the way back then to track cargo and different things, which proves that there was some level of real world application. And they were taught, he shows it in the video talking about smart dust, that they were going to use this to make sure they could effectively monitor and track and, and make the world better for you and your smart grids. And so my point is simply, I believe this stuff is already being utilized. And what does that mean is a whole nother conversation and how that might overlap with COVID-19 is a whole nother conversation as well. But one last point, Robert Langer, who is a person who was chief in the creation of a lot of this work that overlaps with the internal biosurveillance is the co-founder of Moderna. This man was the co-founder mm -hmm. of Moderna, which made some of these COVID-19 shots, which utilized the lipid nanoparticle technology to make this thing effective. Or so they say effective. One of those episodes where you're like, I need a drink to get through it and get a drink now while your palate and your private wine tasting capacity is still something the government doesn't know anything about. Eventually, you know, you'll go out with your glass of wine to watch a sunset, some smart dust will end up under your tongue. And then that's it. The feds are going to know you're drinking. They're going to know if you like it, if you don't like it, they're going to know all that stuff. And so drink while you still can in privacy at allisonwinepromo.com. You get 50% off my favorite wines and 50% off shipping. These are high altitude, extremist altitude Malbecs from Argentina. They're Far fewer pesticides in this region. It's very dry. The grapes work very hard for you, and it's worth it. Can't get them at the grocery store. Why would you want to? Great company that is very free speech, has never told me what I can say, who I can talk to, any of that stuff, which is hard to find these days. And also, they make a great product. So don't forget AllisonWinePromo.com. I have a P.O. box. You can send me some mail. P.O. Box 3355, Denellen, Florida, 34432. I love getting letters. Love getting your winning only lottery tickets, please. Uh, anything else you want to send other than like really creepy... I'm going to kill you with magazine letter cutout uh, things and then no edibles because I'm not going to eat them. I'll think that you're probably going to poison me. So other than that, you know, it's a great way to support my work too. Even if it's just sending me a note of encouragement, love reading your mail. Okay, Ryan, it looks like you have pulled something up. Truly so let's look at this. this stuff like this. When we, if we want to replay it now, if you want, this is the video that I that Just the, the, the shortened ahead. version of this. So this is MakerCon. This is Alistair. Uh, it says his name in there. It'll, it'll come up. Um, he, he's an expert in this technology. And he's discussing, and this, what, this is a video from nine years ago. And in this video, he discusses that this was available 10 years ago. Just to place how long ago this was. My point in this is to go over, you know, just to, so people can see that this is real stuff. And then I, I'll, I'll go over some of the, you know, points I made in these articles to show you kind of why I think today this is a relevant topic. Literally scatter it, this stuff like it. dust or embed it into a sheet of paper. This was commercially released 10 years ago. Um, it's a tiny computer and it features data pro uh, processing, data storage. Now, for, for those watching, that was, I'm, I edited this for an opening clip. This is not the same as the Mew chip you just saw. This is about the same or smaller than what you were looking at. This is the DARPA original vi vision of the smart dust chip. So this is, I just cut, I want to make sure that was clear. This one he's talking about is the DARPA version. Features data pro, uh, processing. It's a tiny computer and it features data pro, uh, processing, data storage, wireless comms. And it's probably as close to the true smart dust vision from the early DARPA days as we've come so far. They're designed to harvest energy from the environment around them and to communicate via a mesh network. There you are. Let's play devil's advocate. Let's steel man the argument here. And let's let's just put ourselves in their shoes. Because every time you hear people talking about this, like Elon Musk, for instance, or like doctors who may be pro uh, this kind of technology, it's like, look, this is going to transform our ability to help people. Like the folks who can't walk are going to be able to walk again. Or you see articles Maybe. like this, brain meets origami, ingenious deployable electrodes transform craniosurgery. So, so the advocates 
are going to look at it and say, you know, what's wrong with you guys? You're just hater Neanderthal people who want to deal with cows on your pasture busting through fences, which is what I do all weekend instead of doing cool stuff like this, where you can actually, you know, you can, you can like make some serious advancements. Like who wants to farm when you can do this kind of stuff? Uh, what do you say to that? You know, with, with, with how they say we're going to help people, we can heal people. Like this is going to be sure. amazing. Maybe. Sure. Maybe. I mean, it's, it's all hypothetical, right? So, I mean, are, are we really at a point where we can't, recognize how things are dual use in pretty much every aspect a hammer can build a house and also break your head in right so are we going to argue that hammer shouldn't be like the point is simply that it, the if we're looking at this stuff and we know that the very people who are involved with this work have been egregiously and almost almost incessantly lying to us about what's involved with these current shots or any number of other aspects that we can prove we're being lied to about, or even if you disagree with all of that, the simple reality, what if Russia gets a hold of it? What if China uses it, right? It's like, we, how come we can't stand back and go, okay, it can be used this way. So why would we just march in goose stepping blindly into what this could be used as? Could it be used to help people with Parkinson's and so on? I haven't seen that proven yet, but hypothetically it might be able to. So is that one possibility or the idea of alleviating neurodegenerative problems or is that all worth allowing this kind of like if we're talking about the the of uh, the idea the time of of privacy being a for like a bygone era we don't even grasp what this will look like the idea of literally no like okay there's a guy named i think it's giordano he's a, a guy who worked with nato the Pentagon, the military in general, he's a expert in neuroscience and neuro weapons. He talks about this and has been talking about it for years. He put out something in 2020 talking about this exact point that right now they are aggressively leaning into trying to figure out how to do this. And what he's talking about is utilizing what we're discussing, neuroparticulates, nanotechnology, in order to be able to not just do what we discussed and surveil, but literally, and then we'll get into this next since it's becoming more obvious in this conversation, control how you feel, what you think about things, and literally even actually how you will move throughout your day. Now, these things may sound crazy, but the point is, go ahead. No, I don't think it sounds crazy at all. I think that seems like a very obvious next step. But my question for you, not to interrupt you, was going to be the reverse then, which is there's not really any way to do that without gathering tons of data on somebody. And so are you going to have literal thought crimes, for instance, at some point in the future, like Allison thought about going to the Capitol on January yeah. 6th or, or whatever, because the, because we're going to be participating in something and think, Hey, it's only unidirectional. It's coming to me to help me, but there's not really any way to do that without it going the opposite direction. They've got to be able to store your data. Just like my doctor, for instance, is like, Oh, electronic health records, whatever, you know, <laughs> it's all private HIPAA. Um, you know, but there's always a way for it to, to be used against you at some point down the road. Right. And yeah. I think you say can be used against you in the court of law. So that's where my mind goes to. Yeah. And well, but again, and you're right, but that's still a very, a very like, you know, the bottom level of where this really goes to, right? We're, this is the point. It's like, we're still in our minds stuck on video cameras and data. Like they're way past this point. Like if we're, and this gets into the whole world economic forum discussions they're having. What you just said is a discussion that they put forward about using internal, like be, it, I forget the video's name, but they're talking about the women at work where they're tracking their mental thoughts and what they're doing. And then they're able to d discern that people have broke the law. So they, it's terrifying. This is a presentation of the world economic economic forum, right? So it's very real that this is something that's being discussed. My point though, is that if we're again at the world economic forum and other presentations, if they're literally talking about the, and currently being able to use your Wi-Fi router in your house to be able to 3d map what they're looking at to like a specific degree, that's now we don't need video cameras anymore. Wi-Fi is around the world. So my point is, we need to start recognizing that they have progressed to a level and we're stuck back in the stone age where we, in the mental state, the way we perceive what's actually going on. We need to start understanding that they're geoengineering, that they're using nanotechnology, that it has likely been deployed around the world. And the point is for me is there's a level of informed consent that's obviously paramount right there. Like we can talk about helping people all day long, but the only way you're going to effectively do that is if first of all, they can find out how this can you be utilized on a global scale and that's why they talk about the smart dust and, and mm -hmm. smart grids. But when do I get to say no to that? Because look, you can't put this stuff in the atmosphere without us and being able to breathe this in. 